Hi, my name is Mike Goddard. I'm a field engineer in the enablement group at Pivotal. This module is about data definition language, or DDL, in Greenplum database. Data definition language is the SQL syntax that you use to manage database objects. In this module, you'll appreciate that working with Greenplum is in many ways similar to working with other database systems you're familiar with. And you'll also recognize a few caveats that arise due to its massively parallel processing architecture. In many ways, if you've worked with PostgreSQL in the past, you'll find a lot of this very, very familiar because Greenplum is a derivative of Postgres. It's worth mentioning that there are no commercial database systems that are fully compliant with the SQL standard. Greenplum database is almost fully compliant with the SQL 1992 standard with most of the features from SQL 1999. Also, several features from SQL 2003 have been implemented, most notably the SQL OLAP features. Once we've completed this module, you should be able to describe what a database is and how to manage it with SQL commands, describe schemas and tables and manage these with SQL commands, identify constraints, recall the data type supported by Greenplum, Describe other database objects, including views, indexes, sequences, triggers, and table spaces. But first, as a warm-up, we'll exercise several of these DDL functions that we're going to go over in this module. And to do that, we're going to use the uh, Greenplum Sandbox VM, which is available from the greenplum.org website. And I was given access to an early release of the AMI which I've installed in a m4.8x large instance in the Amazon EC2 cloud. So we're going to use that. Okay, in this demonstration, I just want to go through a few of the different DDL commands that we're going to be talking about in the slide deck that we're going to go through. So the first one is I want to create a table that has two columns where the table is distributed by both of the columns. They're both integer types. So I'll just run through this command. I'll log into the demo database using my PSQL client. So the command is just create table, uh, dist AB, I just named it that. It has a column A and a column B. Uh, the types are int for both of them. And then here's that distributed by clause. So now what I want to do is populate that table with some data. And I'm going to insert some repeating values here. I have a row for where A is 1 and B is 1. And then here where A is 1 and B is 2. A is 2 and B is 1. And they're both equal to 2. So now what I want to do is take a look at the result of this query. So what this query does is it selects the values from A and B, and it also selects a column, which is kind of a pseudo column that you get with every table called GP segment ID. And this gives the segment identifier for where that row lives uh, in the cluster. We only have two segments here. It's a very small. VM. But what you'll notice is in the first row where A is equal to 1, um, it's going to be housed on segment ID 1 and also on segment ID 0. And then there's a value where B is 1 on segment ID 1 and another one on segment ID 0. So what this is going to help us understand later on is when we talk about things like uh, unique constraints that there's only um, in a distributed system like this it's it's impossible to really to enforce uh, unique constraints on more than one column so that's why i wanted to introduce this concept here um, so you can um, create arrays as well so let me just drop this table if it exists and I'm going to create a table 
called R, ARR of float, so array of float 8. And uh, the purpose of this is just to show you that um, in addition to the ID and timestamp columns here, so I've got a timestamp type here now, I have this engine params column which is declared to be of type uh, array of float 8. So it's going to be a five element array, each of which is a float 8. And again, that was distributed by ID. So another thing, another object we're going to talk about is a view. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a view on that AB table. So I'm creating this view VAB as uh, select AB from the dist AB table we created earlier. And I'm going to add an order by clause, order by column A uh, in descending order. And the reason I did that with the order by is there's another nuance here. Um, so I said to order it by A in the view, but here you can see that A has the value 2, 1, and 2, and 1. So the point is, is that in a view, this order by or any sort is going to be ignored. So what you do to overcome that is just don't declare the order by in the view, but when you do a select from the view, you apply your order by in that select. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and create an index. So we're going to create an index called distABAIDX on distAB uh, on the A column. So now we have an index there. Um, now I want to view the indexes that are in this database. And if I'm in the PSQL client, it has all these kind of shorthand meta commands and backslash di is going to show me the indexes that I have. And there's our index. So uh, let's go down and the next thing I have here is to drop the index. So let's do that. So indexes can be dropped. Uh, it's obvious uh, syntax. Uh, most of these syntactical features are probably very familiar um, if you have a background in databases. And, and this one here will be too. So this is going to create a sequence called myseq. Oh, okay, I already have one. Oop, if I can type that correctly. No, I can't type it correctly. It's my SEQ. Okay, so we can create a sequence and we can drop a sequence. There, I got it to create. So those are the syntax uh, features for managing sequences. And this is a sequence which we gave it a name. We told it to start with the value uh, 101. So now I can insert into my table from that sequence. And now I've got another row which has uh, two consecutive values that were taken from that sequence. I can also view the sequence with the backslash ds, and then I can get some more information. So that shows me all the sequences that are in the database that I'm logged into, which is called demo, which that will show me. Then I can do a select star from the sequence. And that gives me stuff like last value and the maximum value. Um, these are big ints, so uh, they can be fairly large. 
Um, there's another value here, the cached value. By default, it's one. You may want to alter that in a bigger, uh, in a Greenplum MPP environment. It can make sense to, uh, for performance to have a larger cache value. So I just altered my sequence and told it to cache 100 values. As in Postgres, a Greenplum database instance can have one or more user-created databases. These databases reside on a single system but do not share any data. Clients can connect to and have access to one database at a time. Three databases are created by default when you initialize your Greenplum array. Template 1, which is the default template which will be used to create other databases. Don't create any objects in this database unless you want those to also be uh, created in other databases that you make. Any database can be used as a template. They just provide a way to clone uh, database objects and, and you can specify which one to use if you don't want to use template 1. Template 0 is the blank template that is actually used to create template 1. This one shouldn't be modified or dropped. There's a Postgres database. It's uh, internally used by the system and also shouldn't be modified or dropped. Postgres and Greenplum databases do share many commands, like I mentioned. Here they use the same syntax to create, drop, or alter a database. In the right-hand column here, you see the command line equivalents, which operate outside the database, but yield the same results as create database and drop database. Schemas. Schemas allow you to logically organize the database for users or functional areas. For example, data from third-party applications could be stored in a separate schema to prevent collisions with the names of database objects in other places. They don't represent users, as is the case in some database systems. They contain named objects like tables, views, indexes, data types, functions, and operators. They pro provide a namespace, so they allow you to have more than one object, such as a table, with the same name in the database without a conflict, as long as they're in different schemas. For the database to know which schema it should look for when trying to find an object, you can use the qualified name. If you don't want to use the qualified name, you can set the search path parameter. This tells the database in which order to search the available schemas for objects. The schema listed first in your search path becomes your default schema, which is where new objects will be created unless you specify otherwise. Each newly created database has a default schema named public. By default, all roles have create and usage privileges on the public schema. For schemas you create, you need to use grant to provide the appropriate privileges to roles other than the owner. In addition to public, the other uh, schemas that you'll see are a PG catalog, which contains the system catalog tables, built-in data types, functions, and operators. It's always part of the schema search path, even if not explicit. Uh, information schema consists of standardized set of views that contain information about the objects within the database. These views get system information from the system catalog tables in a standardized way. PG Toast stores large objects such as records that exceed the page size. This schema is used internally by the Greenplum database. PG Bitmap Index stores bitmap index objects such as lists of values. This schema is also used internally by GPDB. PG underscore AO SEG stores append own optimized table objects. This schema is also used internally by Greenplum. The GP Toolkit schema is an administrative schema which contains external tables, views, and functions that you can access with SQL commands. All database users can access P GP Toolkit to view and query the system log files and various system metrics. A table in a relational database is a lot like a table in a spreadsheet. It has a fixed number of columns, and they are in order, and each column has a name. 
it has a variable number of rows. There's no guarantee about the ordering of the rows in any table. One important difference about tables in a Greenplum database is that their rows are physically distributed across potentially many computers on different segments in a cluster. Because the tables are distributed, some features are not supported in Greenplum. Uh, for example, referential integrity constraints or foreign keys. They're accepted in the DDL for the table, but they're not actually enforced. The table cannot have multiple columns that have unique constraints. And any single column that has a unique constraint must also be declared in the distribution key. In the demo, we looked at that table that had two columns ident uh, identified in the distribution key. And as we entered in those uh, four rows, we could see that uh, for each combination uh, of number, um, it was not possible to ensure that um, each of the columns had only distinct values on any given segment. And that was just to illustrate this complication in, in a massively parallel environment. Let's examine distribution keys in greater detail because this is a very important concept in Greenplum. Table distribution is critical to getting the best performance. In every table, one or more columns is specified as the distribution key. Avoid using more than two columns, though. For each row, a hash is computed based on the value of this column, and this hash value determines which segment will store that row. To ensure an even distribution of data, Choose a column with high cardinality. If that's not possible, you can declare distributed randomly. If a distributed by clause is not supplied, then either the primary key, if the table has one, or the first eligible column at the table can be used as the distribution key. If a table doesn't have any column of an eligible data type, the, the rows would be distributed randomly. Types that, that are not eligible as distribution keys would be user-defined types and uh, geometric types from um, the PostGIS package, for example. Distributed by is handled in great detail later on. You can alter several properties of a table, including column names, the name of the table itself, the number of columns if you add or remove them, constraints on the table, uh, default values for columns in the table, and the column data types. Each column has a data type. Choose the data type that's most appropriate to the type of value that will be stored in that column. Users can also define their own data types. These are called user-defined types. Any given table has a maximum of 1,600 columns. For a list of other size limitations, you can Google FAQ Pivotal Greenplum Limits. That'll show you a lot, any, any limits that exist within Greenplum. Constraints are a way to further limit and control the data that a table contains, limiting the data to a valid to a set of valid values. Check constraints limit data based on a condition that you specify. Not null constraints specify that a column can't have a null value when you insert a row or update a row. The primary key indicates that a column or group of columns can be used as a unique identifier across the entire table. Primary key is a combination of a unique and a not null constraint. You can define the following types of constraints. Unique constraints, not null, the check constraint, um, and keep in mind that null is the default value, but you can specify one for a column using the default uh, syntax, which is shown here. And keep in mind that for unique constraints, because of the nature of Greenplum, the distributed platform, that you can really only have one unique constraint per table. External tables will be covered in great detail in other sections within this course. So for now, we'll just provide a quick overview. Readable external tables are typically used for fast parallel data loading from sources that are uh, external to the database.
Once an external table is defined, you can query its data directly in parallel using SQL commands. For example, you can select, join, or sort external table data. You can also create views for external tables. However, DML operations, update, insert, delete, or truncate, are not allowed on readable external tables. And you cannot create indexes on readable external tables. Writable external tables are typically used for unloading data from the database into a set of files or named pipes. Writable external ta web tables can also be used to output data to an executable program. Once a writable external table is defined, data can be selected from database tables and inserted into that writable external table. Writable external tables only allow insert operations. Greenplum supports all data types defined in the SQL standard and all the built-in data types supported in PostgreSQL. If desired, you can also define your own custom data types. So a few examples of some of the types. There's a very large list here. Um, just for reference, this is available in the Greenplum Database Administrator Guide. Greenplum also supports type casting. A cast is just used to convert between one type to another. And you've got a few different syntactical variants here. You've got where you declare the type and then you have the string version of it. You've got the type as a string and then the double colons and then the type. That's a Greenplum extension. Uh, and then you've got this cast uh, and you have this value for say you had a numeric value like a uh, an int and you want to promote it to big int because you're doing a comparison to something that's big int something like that um, if there's no ambiguity and you're inserting rows into a table that has a certain type declared there's no no need to do any casting So now let's look at some other database object types, uh, views, indexes, sequences, triggers, and table spaces. Views are a way to save frequently used or complex queries and then access them later using a select statement as if they were a table. A view is not physically materialized on disk though. The query is run whenever the view is accessed. And we looked at in the demo the order by and sort operations were ignored uh, in the view that we created. And you can also um, look at the views if you use the PSQL client, the backslash db or db plus will give you information on the views in your database. So here's an example of a view that was used to encapsulate some fairly complex transformations which are applied as data is loaded from an external table containing some automobile telemetry data. So you've got case statements and you're casting things as float. Um, you're taking the substring of one of the values. You only take the first 10 characters um, and you're creating a timestamp from that. And all this is being taken uh, in a, from, as a uh, select from an external table where you're splitting it on, on a comma character. So it's, uh, these can be pretty powerful. In this case, it also serves to document that uh, ETL or uh, ELT process. Greenplum database is very fast at sequential scanning. Unlike a traditional database, the data is distributed so that each segment scans a smaller portion of the overall data to get the result. If you add to that uh, the, the ability to partition the data, you can reduce your data scan requirements even further. Given that, an index, which uses a random seek to find uh, any record, may not always improve query performance in Greenplum. Note that the query planner tends to favor sequential scans over index scans. An index does add some database overhead as well. It has to be maintained whenever the table is updated. So you want to ensure that if you do create indexes, they're actually being used in your query plans. 
Greenplum database does have uh, one limitation regarding unique indexes. To enforce the uniqueness of an index across the segments, unique indexes are only allowed on distribution key columns. Sequences. Uh, creating a sequence generator involves creating and initializing an, a new special single row table with the given sequence name. Sequences are typically used to increment unique ID columns for a table whenever a new record is added. In Greenplum, due to its MPP distributed nature, there are a few limitations with sequences. LastVal and CurVal are not supported. SetVal can only be used to set the value of the sequence generator on the master. It can't be used in subqueries to update records on distributed table data. Next val will sometimes grab a block of values from the master for a segment to use, depending on the query. So values may sometimes be skipped in the sequence if the entire block turns out not to be needed at the segment level. So you may have cases where you don't necessarily have um, uh, adjacent values that you see. The big serial and serial data types are actually going to be auto-incrementing. So you can actually use those in your tables, and they'll act like sequences. Triggers are functions or procedural code that automatically get executed whenever a specific type of operation gets performed. Triggers are typically used for maintaining the integrity of data within the database. Due to the distributed nature of Greenplum, the use of triggers is somewhat limited. The function used in the trigger must be immutable meaning it cannot use information not directly present in its argument list. The function specified in the trigger also cannot execute any SQL or modify the database in any way. Given that triggers are most often used to alter the database, for example, to update certain other rows when a row is updated, these limitations result in triggers being of little use in Greenplum. The triggers are also not supported on append optimized tables. A table space allows super users to define an alternative location on the file system where the data files containing database objects such as tables and indexes may reside. This usage allows administrators to store specific table spaces on faster drives if the service level agreement requires it. A user with appropriate privileges can pass the table space name to create database, create table, or create index and have the data files for these objects stored within the specified table space. Once the table space has been created, data objects can be created there. So in review, uh, by now you've probably concluded that GPDB's DDL syntax is pretty accessible, being pretty similar to what's found in other databases you might be familiar with. Still, there are some nuances to keep in mind. In this MPP environment, distributed by is very important. Some features, such as indexes, which are routinely used in other databases, aren't used nearly as frequently in GPDB. Certain features, such as enforcing referential integrity or multiple unique constraints, simply aren't available here. 